Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I welcome you to the third Patsy Robertson Memorial Lecture? And let me at the outset recognize um, our guest lecturer. Uh, no prizes for guessing who that might be. Um, Cherise Francis, um, who will be addressing the question, can the Commonwealth be you? And I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Lane Robinson in a moment, the Head of Social Policy Development and the Secretariat, to speak and to introduce Cherise. Uh, but before that, I wanted to make two uh, quick points. First, when we instituted this uh, lecture in memory of Patsy, shortly after her untimely death in 2020, we recognize not just Patsy, as our founder of this association, as our chair for many, many years, um, and as an outstanding champion of the Commonwealth. On the plaque we have by her tree that we planted in May, it says, a voice and face of the modern Commonwealth, and she truly was. Uh, but she was also someone who was interested in ideas and as the Commonwealth as a meeting of minds as well as values, uh, which is why this lecture, I think, is so appropriate. But Patsy also believed, and this is really my second point, she believed in young people and in uh, the capacity of future generations uh, to be engaged with and to be inspired by the ideals for which the Commonwealth stands. And um, that's why it's so appropriate that we should have uh, teamed up this year with the Commonwealth Youth Programme in its uh, 50th anniversary year. Um, and uh, Lane Robinson, the Head of Social Policy Development, has been so helpful to us in, and generous in, in the way that they supported the lecture uh, this year, and we're very grateful to that, uh, Lane. And you've also been so accommodating, and so have your colleagues in, in the division in uh, helping us with all the details of, of this event. So uh, without more ado, I will now ask Lane to, I think, say something about the anniversary year, um, but then to introduce uh, Cherise to you and uh, to deliver the lecture. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, Stuart. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all as members of the association back in Marlborough House um, for this very important third lecture. Um, to remember also and honor Patsy Robertson. My name is Lane Robinson, I'm head of social policy. And it's been a pleasure to work alongside you in hosting this uh, memorial lecture. This is the year of youth and it's significant because this is the 50th anniversary of the youth program. And I know many of you have known about that program, supports that program and we want to honor and cherish that memory of the program. In another two weeks, um, the, in August, the program will celebrate its 50th anniversary. Um, and we want to um, honor that memory that some of you would have. Later this year, in September, we hope to have a special reception at St. James's Palace, when I think if some of you are inclined to be a part of that celebration to honor those who have contributed to the program, we'll be honored to have you. And so we'll communicate with the team to, to see how, who is interested to be a part of that. Really to say the program, those of us who are a part of the program today would not be here had it not been for the many of you who worked and supported the program in the past. So I look forward to that opportunity, but for today to say thank you for um, taking part in this year of youth activity. Our team has been so very happy to work alongside you some of our project team is here in the room. There are young people, they're being inspired by you. A lot of my team members have been here. They're in the back of the room now, they've come primarily because um, they wanna hear about your experiences in the Commonwealth and how that could help them to make their current role better, but also for the future of the Commonwealth. So for my part, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Secretary General, um, the right honorable Patricia Scotton wanted to be here. I worked really hard to make sure she was here, but she's just not in the area at all. Um, but she did send a message that I've asked if I could read. Um, and with your permission, I'll just read what she wanted to say to you herself, if that's okay. 
Okay, so she says here, Excellencies, distinguished guests, Commonwealth friends and colleagues, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Marlborough House as you gather to honor and celebrate the life and legacy of one of the leading lights in the history of the Commonwealth's family. I want to thank our esteemed lecturer today, Sharif, um, an expert on youth development who, she says, I have no doubt will speak powerfully about our theme today. She says, I want to thank you, Stuart, and the Commonwealth Association for all the work you have done to make today possible and for everything you do to honor Patsy's memory. I particularly want to thank Patsy's family and friends. We, wish, we all wish that Patsy was with us here today, but we can count ourselves fortunate to be a part of the Commonwealth, which she worked so hard for, and part of a world which is bet a better place because of the life she lived. Patsy remains a figure of great consequence in the history of the Commonwealth. She was a brilliant communicator and, a natural, and her natural warm charm and gentle charisma saw her rise from the press office to a seat to senior management. She was trusted and valued by diplomats, politicians, the media, the royal household, and she was admired by everyone she encountered. You all know that her skillful, subtle, delicate diplomacy was pivotal in some of the most critical moments of our shared history, especially the Commonwealth's decisive stance against apartheid. She stood for what was right, and she embodied the values of our charter. The charter which is signed 10 years ago this year and centralizes the value and importance of our 1.5 billion young people, 60% of our population. It highlights the positive and active role and contribution of young people in promoting development, peace, democracy, and in protecting and promoting Commonwealth values. Our theme today, Can the Commonwealth Be Youth, is not new, she says. Indeed, I imagine it was the same question Commonwealth heads of government were asking in 1973 when they established the Commonwealth Youth Program. But in today's world, which is tightly bound by a tangled knot of crises spanning global economic, environmental, and security systems, it is more pertinent than ever. The Commonwealth with Patsy believed in the power of our association, the strength of our principles, and the nature of our advantages gives us limitless potential as a family of nations. She says we can rise to the challenges of the world together. And we can work together to enable our young people to seize the opportunities of digitization and progress to build a more peaceful and sustainable future. This is the spirit running through this Commonwealth Year of Youth. Indeed, this event is part of our year of celebration. One of the things which makes the Commonwealth so special is its willingness to continue to come together. One of the because this is where we are together, working together, listening and trusting each other, we can make things happen. This is progress. So she says, finally, I'm delighted to know that you have come together again today to honor the memory of a remarkable person and to consider how we can work with our young people to build a better future. I wish I was with you in person, but I am with you in spirit. And I join you in renewing my commitment to the principles of which Patsy held so dear democracy, equality, human rights, and a fierce belief in the young people of the Commonwealth. Thank you. That was the SD's message. Without any further ado now, allow me to present one of our young people that SD spoke so wonderfully of. So Charisse Francis is a legal professional, researcher, and educator. She holds an LLB from the University of the West Indies, a legal education certificate from Hugh Whitting Law School, and an LLM in human rights and criminal justice from the University of Aberdeen. She's committed, she completed this latter degree as a Commonwealth scholar in 2018. Since being called to the Barbadian legal bar in the same year, she has interacted with the Caribbean legal sector in both government and non-governmental capacities. Presently, she's a doctoral candidate at the University of Warwick, researching trafficking persons in the Caribbean. At the same institution, Charisse is a seminar tutor for undergraduate and master's students. For over a decade, 
She has been involved in voluntary youth development work locally and internationally. She serves as a trustee for Small Enterprises for Education and Development, SEED, in Barbados, an NGO which is committed to the personal and professional development of young people in Barbados and the diaspora. She's a member of our Commonwealth Human Rights Youth Network and a proud member of it as well. And she's a member of the Young Feminist Fund, Frida, Global Advocacy Committee, Caribbean Region. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our lecturer, guest speaker, for this is third Patsy Robertson Memorial Lecture, Cherise Francis. I want to applause for her. So good afternoon and thank you so much. Usually when I'm being referred to as a lecturer, it's by undergraduate students who have no idea that I'm also just a student, a PhD student like them. So it's a distinct honor to be here before so many of you with so many vast years of experience that I am myself yet to encounter or envision. I'm excited to see each of you here as members of the Commonwealth family, but I also think that it's fortuitous that as we are here, to celebrate the legacy of Patsy Robertson with this third lecture, the first to be held in person, that the face you see before you is mine. It is a distinct honor for me to deliver this lecture. Although I did not know Patsy, I relate to her in so many ways, and you will hear about them. It is even more delightful for me to be here in this year of youth and my, one of my last official years as a young person. So for me, this is also the passing of a baton. I wanted to begin my remarks with a story for a few minutes, if you would indulge me. So once upon a time, there was a little girl who was born in a small island, unknown to many except as a holiday hotspot or a place for celebrities. But for her, it was home. She was a child of teachers, so she understood that education is a gift beyond measure and that with a solid educational foundation and a strong work ethic, the world was hers to conquer. That little girl grew up. She had big dreams of impacting the world. So she studied and she worked hard. Eventually, the woman that she became accomplished those dreams, breaking gender barriers and thriving in the face of inequalities and, and oppression in positions far removed from her upbringing. When things seemed not to be going her way, she changed course. And instead, she chose to home firmly anchored in the principles from her homeland of resilience, dedication, and a little bit of charm. More than anything, she never forgot the value of others and using her successes to speak for those who do not have the opportunity to speak for themselves. Where she felt that the necessary platforms did not exist, she worked with like-minded individuals to create them. Some of you may have already guessed, but this is my very truncated and simplified story of Patsy Robertson. I'm sure that for those of you who knew her, this version does not do justice to her essence, and I'm sorry for that. However, I started with it for a few reasons. First of all, it's 5 p.m., all of you had a long day, and everybody loves stories. Secondly, this was my way of paying tribute. As a young person, I believe that we must know the history and the past that have led us to where we are. And I've learned that from so many of you as I spoke to you just before we came into this room. There are few people who can embody all that it means to be Commonwealth. But in reading and in learning about the life that this remarkable woman has led, I got a deeper appreciation for the concept of a Commonwealth citizen. Progress, innovation, diplomacy, collaboration, and grace, bolstered by a love and a concern for people, all Commonwealth people. Thirdly, and perhaps most of all, I told you this because it is also my story. I too am from a small island and the child of teachers. In fact, my mother is here with me today and it is only because of the lessons that she, my family, and my community instilled in me, the care that they provided as I was growing, that I'm able to harness opportunities such as this. In many ways, it also bears striking similarities to thousands of young people across the Commonwealth, 
who at every chance are striving for better for themselves and for those around them. As I reflected on what has been written and said about Patsy, the Commonwealth young people who I've met, a few of them are here today, and what I could say today that would be of any significance, I was left with a question. Can the Commonwealth be youth? I thought about you in the sense that each Commonwealth young person should feel included and be aware of what this body represents and what it offers, but also youth in that every young person here is reflected and championed in spaces of leadership. These two partitions sum up what I believe are the key challenges facing the Commonwealth today. And I will use that to center what I share going forward. My aim is to use my words to remind you of your commitments as former officers and citizens of the Commonwealth, the commitment to young people, to start an internal and an external dialogue for you about the promise and the hope of the Commonwealth and your contribution to this formulation. More than 60% of the estimated 2.5 billion people living in the Commonwealth, as you heard from the SG's comments, are age 30 and under, therefore youth. That means that mathematically speaking, the Commonwealth is youth. Additionally, our guiding document, the Commonwealth Charter, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, recognizes the importance of young people in the Commonwealth as core belief 13. The Charter states, we recognize the positive and active role and contributions of young people in promoting development, peace, democracy, and protecting and promoting other Commonwealth values. But in reality and in practice, if we look around us on a daily basis, for each of us, do we uphold these ideals which would make the Commonwealth youth? And what would that really mean? I suggest to you, as a young person standing before you, who has been involved in the Commonwealth in one way or another since I was a teenager, that presently we do not not as much as we should. Over time, the Commonwealth through the youth program, the Commonwealth scholarships, and the various other institutions has made strides in enabling youth participation, education, and leadership. We have done some to change this world for the better. In just the last year and a half, I have seen a young man from Jamaica write a book which teaches children about public speaking. A young woman from Sri Lanka with the support of the Commonwealth Youth Program, hosted a capacity building human rights session, both virtually and in person, in a climate which was otherwise seeking to hinder the freedom of expression of youth. And I have seen a young man from Northern Ireland who uses sports as a way to teach young people and engage with them on human rights and democracy. You see, these are the kinds of innovations and triumphs that we do and we should celebrate. Yet, on an almost weekly basis, I lament with colleagues and friends about how much more needs to be done. We discuss how there is never enough money, how we feel as though we're not respected, how much of our involvement is tokenistic, and how it is always the same faces in the room at every single gathering. What should alarm you is not only the tones of our conversations, but the fact that we are in the minority. These discussions take place in the safety of closed corridors among those of us who are committed to Commonwealth processes. Outside these circles, there's a large percentage of young people, untapped potential, who have no interest in the Commonwealth, nor do they see it as important to their lives. So here is where I invite you to dream with me as we seek to change that disengaged narrative and imagine a relevant Commonwealth that is youth. For that, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. Our forebears have already done that. We just need to turn to the charter. The second part of Core Belief 13, which I mentioned earlier, recognizes that the future success of the Caribbean, sorry, the Commonwealth, I'm thinking about home, <laughs> rests with the continued commitment and contributions of young people. Furthermore, the Charter commits to investing in and promoting the development of young people, 
particularly through the creation of opportunities for youth employment and entrepreneurship. Ordinarily, after stating these profound commitments, I would call upon you to hold governments accountable for implementation, but today I will not. One of the resounding lessons which young people, including myself, took away from the Commonwealth Youth Forum in Kigali, Rwanda last year after the address of the Commonwealth Secretary General was that government action is important, but we need to focus on those low hanging fruits. What is it that we can achieve, us with our skills, our resources, and each other? Similarly, the Commonwealth is made up of we, the people, so I'm shining the light on each of you to do your part. I will go even further using examples of some Commonwealth youth successes and challenges to show you how. Earlier this year at the Commonwealth Youth Leaders Summit hosted by the Commonwealth Youth Program, our youth leaders under the capable directorship of Lane engaged with the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. And rule 13, the law of the picture suggests that a good leader has to be like a tour guide, knowing the way, going the way, and showing the way. So as an example, and guided by the charter, we will make three stops on this journey towards a progressive commonwealth, providing opportunities, promoting youth, and investment. As we move through these, I will simultaneously maneuver between addressing those of you who were youth and my fellow young people, because it is critical that in this time, we collaborate across cultures and generations. So our first stop, providing opportunities. Young people need those of you in positions of influence to help create opportunities for us to work towards the goals needed to strengthen the Commonwealth, democracy, peace building, and equality for all. In creating those opportunities, there can no longer be the standard operating procedures, moving things to fit within programmatic budgets or larger political agendas. Instead, the programs and the solutions must come from those who they're intended to serve, the youth. You see, those of us who are in the category of Commonwealth youth today do not have the pleasure of conceptualizing future as something that will happen in the long term. For us, the future is living and breathing. We are already there. In the last decade alone, we have survived wars, global health pandemics, economic and political movements, and visible climate changes all in rapid succession and some without warning. Many of these challenges were not created in our lifetime. Nevertheless, they're now our responsibilities to address, simply as a matter of survival. A study done by the ILO, for example, found that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on young people is systematic, deep, and disproportionate. In real words, the pandemic exacerbated vulnerabilities and inequalities that already existed. Many of those young people who had been active volunteers and youth workers are now struggling with burnout, the mental toll of uncertainty, and trying to continue being engaged. But it becomes harder and harder with many of us having to choose between payment to survive or passion to contribute. As Commonwealth, to safeguard our young people, we should not have to choose. So whatever organization you're a part of, in whatever space you have influence, I challenge you to consciously include at least one young person in your decision making. For each Commonwealth institution, I ask you to create a position for a young person and actually fill it with a youth advisor. When you engage with us, do so as an equal with all the respect and the benefits of any other colleague, because we are poised and we are ready to lead, and we will astound you. We are not afraid to try, and we are certainly not afraid to fail, but we are afraid, we are hesitant to start, knowing that there is no support. 
If you want to see what happens when you take a chance on us young people, look at the fourth Commonwealth Conference on Youth Work held last week in Reading. I was not present, but I followed it closely on social media and communicated with friends who were there. By all accounts, young people were incorporated as planners, presenters, and participants. It is that level of mutual exchange that lessens the divide between generations. And we move to our second stop. Not all promotion needs to take the form of more physical opportunities. It is equally as important that our Commonwealth youth have strong mentorship and people walking with us. As I reflect on my earlier days as a youth, not so long ago, and Commonwealth spaces, I am not sure that I was ready, but I am sure that I had no clue what I was doing and far too much unchanneled energy. But a group of older youth believed in me and not wanting to let them down, I flourished. Their promotion gave me the fuel to keep on striving. Unfortunately, many young people do not have as nurturing an experience as I had. Just last year in my country, Barbados, a talented 18 year old, Khalil Kostawalia, was on the cards to become a senator, with our prime minister even raising a constitutional motion which would allow him to serve in this capacity. It quickly became apparent, however, that owing to his age, rather than any proven lack of merit, there would not have been sufficient support in parliament for that motion to pass. While that young man displayed great maturity, suggesting that he would continue to be involved in the governance of Barbados, many in his shoes would have become deterred and lost interest in participating. It is understandable that sometimes the methods we choose as young people for advocacy or programming might be understood, misunderstood, because they're not the way that things have always been done. But the shifting political, social, and environmental climates that we now face dictate that we respond in equally dynamic ways. In the past, young people may have been asking for a seat at the table. But thankfully, we're grateful that due to the work of stalwarts such as Patsy Robertson, those seats are often present. Today, we are asking for a microphone to speak from those seats. Our presence is not enough. And beyond that, we need those microphones to be wireless, cordless, and accessible to more diverse youth representation. There is no promotion of Commonwealth youth unless we are promoting all Commonwealth youth. It will always be a challenge to represent the 56 Commonwealth countries and people of all races, cultures, ethnicities, genders, and abilities. But we have to do better than we're doing now. With that challenge, I ask you to join us as we disrupt the system to show what is important for us as young people. Did you know that it could take a young person from Nauru three days of travel and several modes of transportation to travel each way to London for a meeting? And that even this is time dependent on weather conditions and flooding on the runway? That is the impact of climate change in real time. How could we ask any young person to be committed to a Commonwealth cause when they're unsure whether their home will be lost to the sea in their lifetime. Have you considered that for several of the nations within the Commonwealth, there are passport and visa restrictions which prohibit young people from attending events held within the global north, and that these restrictions are further complicated by historical biases within certain countries that make up our Commonwealth family? Have you thought about how a neurodiverse Commonwealth young person might be impacted by the colors or the format of a source that you provide to us in good faith for a capacity building? Well, we as young people have. These are some of the new human rights issues that affect our existence and our engagement. So as you engage with us, take a minute to understand our realities and bring our concerns into the mainstream agendas. 
for investment, the third stop, I turn to you in this great Commonwealth nation, the youth that are my peers. You are the Commonwealth's Commonwealth, the value of a nation, and indeed this collective of nations, rises and falls with us. If we are to continue calling on support from others to, to engage with us, we have to be responsible for investing in ourselves as individuals and as a collective. There have been too many people, some sitting in this room, who have sacrificed too many for us to be content with sitting in silence. There are too many for whom we are a legacy. Just a few weeks ago, the youth development space lost one of these giants, Dr. Henry Charles Wallace. I could not do this lecture without making his name known. You see, he believed in young people and the power of young people, myself included. He not only promoted youth, but he put us in spaces to thrive. And then he celebrated us as we did so. It is our charge to enlarge their territory and fertilize the trees that they have planted with our labor. It is time for us to start making shifts, not to be consumed or constrained by what we cannot do, but to look for what we can do. And those things which we can't do yet, we work together to plan for how to do them in the near future. The challenges before us may seem insurmountable. First generation university student in the United Kingdom, if you're hearing my voice, whether you're British or from another Commonwealth country, I hear you as you contemplate whether exercising your right to higher education was worth it. Because the current ongoing marking boycott between universities and staff has caused you to not know whether you will receive your degree or when you will receive it. Friend in Nigeria, I saw you earlier this year as you struggle to get a hold of your hard-earned cash to do the bare necessities because of shortages caused by government action. As you think about how society has failed us despite our best efforts, I encourage you to know that there is power in the collective and that the Commonwealth can be a part of that collective for you. In fact, here is where we can call upon the values that Ms. Robertson represented, steadfastness, and consistency, but not being afraid to pivot. The experiences that you're currently having are opportunities for us to upskill and progress towards reshaping the Commonwealth agenda with the identity that we want. If you're seeking inspiration, just look among the Commonwealth Youth Awards finalists for 2022. There, you can find technology, the arts, and even waste being used and harnessed by young people for entrepreneurship, activism, advocacy, and development. Rather than dwelling on the gaps that we have yet to fill, use what you have right now in this moment. As you grasp those opportunities, ask all the questions and challenge the things that seem out of alignment. That is how the Commonwealth got to where it is today. This work requires you to exercise grit. Youth development and Commonwealth work does not yield benefits overnight, as the people sitting in this room well know. It is slow, labor intensive, and requires a team. If I think of my friends and colleagues who inspire me, it looks like holding down a full-time job while working on your side hustle and still, still spending way too much time on the other job. That is the Commonwealth. It's both a calling and a labor of love. So here is how I want you to invest. Do some research on the history of the Commonwealth, the values and principles upon which it is built. Find one way in which this relates to your passions and your projects and seek a Commonwealth institution or individual, past or present, who can help you to solidify that connection. Finally, go out and do. You are now the Commonwealth's ambassadors. You can teach your peers and ensure that we can achieve the goals that we have set. So now I end where I began. First question, can the Commonwealth be you? 
Yes, it can. Look at me. Commonwealth gave me an education through the Commonwealth Scholarship. Commonwealth provided me with opportunities to grow and improve both personally and professionally. But most of all, Commonwealth has given me a community. People who I call on for assistance and who equally call upon me. Right now, I am one of the lucky ones. But if we carry on providing opportunities, promotions and investments, this will be a statement that ripples across all 56 Commonwealth countries in the near future. And when I ask again, can the Commonwealth be youthful? The answer again is a resounding yes, if we collaborate, for that is the Commonwealth way. The Charter affirms that through seeking consensus with consultation and the sharing of experiences, the Commonwealth is uniquely placed to serve as a model and a catalyst for new forms of friendship and collaboration. The young people salute the groundwork that has been laid by each of you, and we are ready to join the ranks. Those of us who are prepared are taking action, and we're bringing our peers with us. Our hope is that we can actualize these plans in a fostering environment, with mentorship, with opportunities, and with investments. I believe that one thing we have all learned from the life that Ms. Robertson lived is that a single individual can create a legacy with the way that they live and the people that they impact. So with this, I leave you to make a Commonwealth with me that is youth. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Cherise, for a very powerful and fluent um, presentation uh, with a lot of challenging thoughts in it. And that uh, challenge in particular to imagine a relevant Commonwealth that is youth, to quote your words. So I think there's a lot there for us. <clears throat> Could I see the first question? Well, I'm going to leap in with the first question uh, while other people think about um, things. Um, Cherise, one of the most visible sides of the Commonwealth is the Commonwealth Games. And uh, it is something which, of course, has something most directly impacting on young people. And uh, you will have seen the news that... Um, uh, the Commonwealth Games in 2026 that was due to be held in Victoria, Australia, is now uh, not going to happen. And uh, there is some, some urgent action to see how that can be, um, can be replaced. There are some commentators who say, well, this, is, this could be the end of the Commonwealth Games. W what is your view of that and, on, and the impact on young people in the Commonwealth? if there was to be no Commonwealth Games? So thank you for the question. For me, I saw that just yesterday, and I also noted that the reason that, the, that persons were pulling out or countries were pulling out was that funding had exceeded what they would thought, had thought it would be. So again, it goes back to the money. But I truly think that it's important that we have a Commonwealth Games. For many young people, sports is the way that they engage. As I mentioned in my lecture, there is young people using sports as a way not only to play and have fun, but also to teach about human rights, to talk about people that they otherwise would not have interacted with. I can think of so many persons that work now within the Commonwealth Youth Program and those spaces whose lives have been changed by sports, who met friends at the Commonwealth Youth Games, who saw the, the Secretary General for the first time at the Commonwealth Youth Games, who got their first opportunity to travel because of the Commonwealth Youth Games. So if something like this is removed, it just makes it seem as though, as I mentioned, the Commonwealth is regressing and not really looking forward to investing in young people. The cost isn't only money. The cost will be putting that, those young people who might not be looking to be intellectuals, who are not able to speak on platforms, but the sports gives them a way to relate. That is what we will be losing, and that is the real value. 
Arif. Yes, the microphone. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, thank you, Josh. I mean, that's a very powerful presentation, which is, I think, what we needed. We always <laughs> looked at young people for that, perhaps. So I've got a 15-year-old and 11-year-old daughter, a 12-year-old daughter now. And I think I'm very struck by listening to you. And I was thinking a lot of, of them while you were speaking. And their world has been upended hugely by COVID. I mean, people think it's out of the headlines. People, you know, your generation, people who are 15 now, who are 12 then, or they are still, many of them across our Commonwealth, living through the impacts of mm -hmm. that. And yet it's hardly referenced. Yeah. The other issue that I wanted to highlight was um, technology we know is a good enabler but we absolutely know it could be a very devastating tool as well for young people mm -hmm. in, the, in the hands of, of, of people that wish them ill. And yet, in both of those examples I've given, and Lane, you please correct me if I'm mistaken, when the health ministers met, or when there are meetings around health, I don't know if we do enough about bringing in young voices, particularly around things like COVID. I don't know when we talk about online harm in the Commonwealth, as we did at the Committee of the Whole a year ago in this building, there was much of a reference or hearing from young people. Mm -hmm. So my concern is simply that these big issues are being talked about. They don't, we don't hear about young people, but I think what you pointed to, you didn't use these three words, but I think there are three words I want to put back to you and offer them up to you as pathways for young people to be more plugged into the Commonwealth ecosystem. One of them is intergenerational. I think Stuart has taken a great initiative with the Commonwealth Association for, you know, around looking at where the Commonwealth Association can work together with young people. That's a great model, but there are also many other examples working with Commonwealth organizations. Be interested to get your thoughts on that. The other word is the other I. There are three I's. The second I is a kind of word of the moment to an extent is intersectional. One of the most fastest growing and vibrant Commonwealth networks is actually since 2018 is the one in which um, they also suffer with um, an, an illegal um, context. I'm talking about the LGBT network in the Commonwealth, known as the Commonwealth Equality Network. Yes, an accredited organization. So when we think of intersectional, it's young women who are also in business. It's young women who may be, you know, who are part of the LGBT community, et cetera, et cetera. Be interested in your thoughts on that as another part we're in. And then the other one, I would the third eye is integrative. So we know about the Commonwealth Networks. Lane, I forget how many there are. There are what, a dozen or so. But one of the most, the one that I think has had tremendous potential but has never really achieved its potential is the CSA, the Commonwealth Students Association. And I wonder at times if all of those organizations, we prioritize them, we put CSA up in the top three, my goodness, what could we do? So I'd be interested in your thoughts about those three words as pathways for young people to be more plugged in into the Commonwealth ecosystem. Thank you. So thank you so much for that. And I think these are excellent pathways. There, there's already ways in which they're being used, but there's also ways in which they could be improved. So I'll start with the first one. I was really happy to hear you mention health and the fact that you don't think youth are plugged in as much because I was going to say there's the Commonwealth Youth Health Network and they're doing incredible work. And I'm sure that if they're even asked or considered, they would be very happy to sit in those rooms and those young people are powerful they will be able to tell you things about health that we even never even knew existed. And they showcased that in Kigali, Rwanda last year when they actually launched one of their projects during the youth forum. The intergenerational part, the Commonwealth Youth Program and the networks are working towards that. When we had the Youth Leadership Summit in March that I mentioned, there was actually an intergenerational dialogue um, that, that happened. And during the sessions, we did have persons come in and speak, speak with us, engage with us. So there are, that intergenerational knowledge is happening, but I don't think it's happening sufficiently. And I think that when it happens right now, it's not the young people taking the lead. So I would like to see that intergenerational dialogue being flipped on its head, giving us the, the leeway to go first or go up front, set the tone, and then have responses coming towards us, open responses, not prepared scripts, coming towards us in that way. I think that could be much more fruitful and feasible. I also think it would be helpful if, while we're talking about this intergenerationality, we have persons come walk with us when young people are having projects, even if it's just five minutes that you have, Come see what we do and how we work on the ground so that you get a better understanding. 
Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, those are our emails, our snail mails. Those are our PowerPoints. Those are the tools that we're starting to use to reach across the world because we don't have the ability to fly all the time. That's not something that's happening for climate change reasons and for financial reasons. But we do get quite a large reach using those tools. So walk with us. Ask us, why are you doing it that way? And what are you achieving through that? So you can see how that's working for us. And then the integrative. I love that. And I think that I agree that CSA is extremely important. And I'm happy to say that we are actually working together of quite a few of the networks. Right now, as we speak, CSA is leading a project that was funded by the Global Education Fund. And the Human Rights Network is actually working with them on that. And this, from this month, there are supposed to be five study sessions virtually on curriculum, de decolonizing the curriculum, advocacy, and education across the Commonwealth that has been open for youth networks and young people across the Commonwealth to register, and there have been over 100 registrants. So we are working together to get that integrative work happening and that intersectionality as well. Next question. Okay, it's me again. I, oh, yes, who is it? Uh, Mark, okay, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for a wonderful address. I was struck by your uh, point about involving young people in Commonwealth organisations. I don't know whether mine comes up to scratch. With the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council, uh, we, we were set up 52 years ago, rather ahead of our time, because we specialise in the relations between humans, forests, oceans, clouds, skies, whatever you want to do. Young people on our board, now some of my old trustees are a bit shocked. We've got four under 30. We've got one from Ghana, one from Samoa, who got himself funded to go to the pre-COP28 um, uh, meeting in Bonn. We've got um, uh, one from London, and uh, we've got our youth advisor, who's a brilliant young man and a specialist in climate change, uh, from India. He's 23. The other two I mentioned are 24. They aren't overawed by being involved with older people. They're encouraged to play their part and they are making a wonderful contribution. So I just, after your wonderful remarks, I hope this gives you a message of great cheer. <laughs> Thank you, that warmed my heart and I really am looking forward to seeing how other organizations join it with the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council and follow that example. Thank you. Karen. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Karen Burrow from the Commonwealth Magistrates and Judges Association. So um, we unfortunately, I don't think have any young people in our um, membership because of the age of judges and magistrates, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. But we do work on youth issues and juvenile justice and issues of that kind. Um, and I think it would be very useful to have a chat, and I will have a chat with you later on. But one of the things that I wanted to ask is, maybe this is more for Elaine than anybody else, is apart from the social workers' conference, um, what other, co and the health ministers, is there an opportunity for the Commonwealth law ministers and the senior officials of Commonwealth uh, minis law ministers to involve young people? I mean, I know the issues have come up. I know there have been a number of issues about um, the, use of, uh, the use of social media and the problems of abuse and cybercrime, but I'm just asking the question. We have never seen young people involved as observers in the same capacity as we are uh, as partner organizations. I think it's an excellent point. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's one of the lasting legacies we want from the year of youth to open up those spaces that are now not open. And perhaps it is right, the right time now to say, let's make the relevant youth networks observers to these other meetings that they are now not a part of. 
I think that's the point we want to make here and, and the examples that we can showcase of where that is happening well, I think we'll do well. And I think we could easily find lots of young legal minds that could happy to be a part of the work you do just to provide that youth perspective, which I think would help to enhance and really grow the work you do among youth population. But I think it's an excellent point. And I think my team here, we are taking note. It's one of the lasting legacies that I hope we can um, drive home this year in the year of youth. Thank you so much. Next question. Yes, Terry. Uh, microphone on its way. Like everyone else in the room, I was really inspired by the clarity and passion and, um, and excellence of your statements. Everything that you said, I thought, was absolutely splendid. You did at the start, talk about the importance of education opportunities for youth. And I would hope that every effort can be made to increase Commonwealth scholarships of all kinds, and also in particular circumstances, here in the Secretariat during the struggles for liberation in Zimbabwe and in Namibia and in South Africa, we had special Commonwealth training programs for people from uh, these countries, working closely with the liberation movements. And uh, this, I think, had a very useful effect. Many of the offers were, of course, bilateral through Commonwealth governments, and uh, some hundreds were through the Secretariat itself. But um, you have stressed the importance of education and I think it cannot be overstressed, and I hope that every effort will be made to expand uh, um, education and training opportunities for Commonwealth youth. Thank you. Thank you. Cherise, can I um, ask you my second question? Sure. <laughs> Um, you are, uh, you're at Warwick at the moment doing your PhD, <clears throat> but you're also involved, I mean, so therefore you're a student, um, but a very mature one, <laughs> obviously. Um, you are also uh, involved in, in teaching, um, MA and undergraduate students. So you're very much on the cusp between a student world and, uh, as it were, an academic world. <clears throat> and we were talking earlier in our annual general meeting about the fact that young people seem to be very open and receptive to the Commonwealth message uh, and about the possibilities of it as a, a future-looking organisation. Whereas uh, within uh, universities and within curriculum, curricula and so on, um, there is a different mindset we find amongst uh, the academic community about treating the Commonwealth seriously. And, and there is a tendency to want to put it into post-colonial studies and into a colonial box in that respect. Uh, and that is something that we find very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, you know, you're from a country uh, that joined the Commonwealth, what, in 1966, was it, or something like that? Something yeah. And uh, you didn't join it because it, you thought it was a colonial organization. <laughs> um, so I wonder if you could talk about what we, some of us, see as being this this tension between the openness of young people to the Commonwealth idea and the closed minds of those who, um, you know, who sometimes teach subjects which should include the Commonwealth. Yeah, so thank you for that. I think that for a lot of young people, awareness about the Commonwealth is lacking. People only come across the Commonwealth with the scholarships, if that's something you're looking for when you're a master's student, or people come across the Commonwealth if they hear the games pop up, but there is never a real thought behind what the Commonwealth actually means. And in fact, even in the spaces of people seeking scholarships, and I can tell you as a past scholarship winner myself, if you have the choice between Commonwealth scholarship or achieving scholarship, people go for achieving. And the reason for that is the message. It's just how the messaging is put across. Achieving is 
sold as a brand. There's everything pushed behind it for that. And the Commonwealth doesn't have, doesn't give that same kind of messaging or that consistent messaging I've found, which is one of the difficulties. However, while I was on Commonwealth scholarship, I felt that we were tremendously more fortunate. I had a wonderful time. So I think that a, a lot of it is the messaging and you're right. The persons who are currently teaching or in academia, the message that they're giving to those students, that the students are receiving, Commonwealth is equated with being a British colonial legacy. And many young people, because decolonizing the curriculum and decolonization of everything is so high on the agenda now for young people, without going further into it or understanding it for themselves, once that message is fed, then that is all there is. And that is another reason why engagement starts to become so low, because young people don't want to be associated with that specific uh, message or methodology. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Gillespie, I think, yes. And, and I ought to... Um, uh, recognize uh, that uh, there are one or two members of Patsy's family here, including Gillespie, um, and uh, that you're very welcome. I'm glad you could, could attend it. We had a reserved seat for you even, but uh, <laughs> so uh, what's your question? Thank you very much, Stuart. Yeah. Uh, yes, Patsy was my sister-in-law, a very wonderful woman. Hmm. Um, you actually stole my question, but I, <laughs> I didn't want to be the first one to make a fool of myself in public, as it were. Hmm. But you made the point about the Commonwealth Games, and what I wanted to say is, if it manages to get off the ground and happen again, it is an enormous opportunity because of the interest to youth. And, you know, great athletes are basically young, except perhaps for Mr. Djokovic, but <laughs> most of them <laughs> are very, very young. A marvelous opportunity to get a very simple message across. And it has to be a brand, it has to be a, something that's really recognizable. And if the Commonwealth Games does go ahead, and if the Secretary General could put across such a message in very simple terms at the beginning, which would grab headlines, it could do a huge amount to uh, concentrate the interests of youth in the direction of the Commonwealth, which I absolutely agree is very important. No, thank you very much. Um, our section coordinates the work on sport for development and peace as well. So I wanted to thank you for the question and, uh, and the discussion you're having on this important issue. But I just wanted to say that this, the, the, the Commonwealth Youth Games will actually be held in two weeks' time in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, that doesn't make the headlines as much, but it's a fantastic opportunity for us, I think, on the back end of this news that we've had about 2026, to promote the fact that the Youth Games are happening in Trinidad and Tobago and that a small island state, Trinidad and Tobago, is hosting these wonderful games and call into question what then is the issue with you know, larger, more developed states in trying to facilitate the same for the rest of the Commonwealth. I think that's the kind of debate that we need to have. But I think you're absolutely right. And in the days to come, I think the Secretary General will continue to reaffirm a positive message about the importance of the games. But we will have a youth games, and that's something to celebrate, and that it's in the Caribbean and a small island state at that. And perhaps that is the next you know, discussion that we should have. But I think the question is well worth it. And we will use every opportunity to send a positive message about the youth and sports going forward. Thank you so much. Nicholas. Yeah, I think, I think we'll have the mic. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'm just picking up on, on Lane's point and... and Teresa's excellent exposition of a, a sort of three-dimensional or 360-degree perspective on youth in the Commonwealth. We know that the Commonwealth's uh, sort of highlights are largely in small island states. And I wonder if you could comment on the traction that SIDS have for youth and how one might make Commonwealth issues more interesting for the use of, say, Africa and Asia, if I'm, I'm correct in my assumption that uh, the Commonwealth is more, more popular with use in, in small island states. Thank you. I think, interestingly, what 
we've found or, or in, in my engagement with um, Commonwealth young people, there's actually quite a large volume of young people in Africa, especially, who are heavily involved in Commonwealth youth work and in Asia as well. But I think that one of the things that would be important is to highlight or look at the issues that are actually facing them and start picking those up as ways to get the messaging across. So for example, in my speech, I would have referenced the young people not being able to access cash or and, and the educational issues that are also happening in parts of Africa with strikes happening and young people not being able to go to university for months on end. So there is very topical cross-cutting issues that affect all young people in the Commonwealth or many young people in the Commonwealth, but contextualizing them for the situation so that young people feel heard or seen would make it more appealing. Because if we see something that we can relate to, then it's easier for us to say, yes, I recognize me in that situation or I recognize my friend in that situation and therefore I want to be involved. I think and that's one of the reasons I mentioned perhaps foregrounding us or including a young person in those discussions or decision makings. Because one of the things about social media is that because we have it, we are plugged into young people in many different countries. So if you have that young person sitting in the room and you ask them, so what's trending on Twitter today? or what's going on on Instagram or Snapchat, they will be able to give you a response in real time in that way. And right now, the Commonwealth Youth Council, and there's a platform called the Com Commonwealth Leadership Academy or Commonwealth Youth Leadership Academy. And what they're doing through the CYC is that there is a WhatsApp group that all young people across the Commonwealth can join. And in that group, the admin, they post opportunities for speeches, they post trainings, they post scholarships, anything that's relevant to young people that they come across, they post in that group. The group started, I believe, two weeks or three weeks ago, and already there are so many young people from all across the Commonwealth involved in that group. One of the other things that they're doing is that they're hosting webinars by young people on various topics for young people, and they're only one hour long. They give you a very specific time frame, and you basically are co-teaching on whatever it is. So there's one on public speaking. I did one on human rights. There's one on leading political movements that happened. There's one on, there was one on financing. There's so many things. So that is the way that we are getting things done, by using the technology and contextualizing so that people recognize themselves in situations. Uh, yes, Terry, just a quick one, and then I think we're almost ready to conclude. <clears throat> Your great enthusiasm, I'm sure, is shared by so many young people. And my question is, how can you, as young people, help the Commonwealth to be seen as distanced from the negative aspects of colonialism? The Commonwealth is the creation of leaders of national liberation movements. It is itself the antithesis of colonialism, the abnegation of imperialism, and a force for good in the world to bring independent democratic countries together. The world needs countries that come together, not to make them similar, but to foster cooperation and development within the framework of friendship. As Her Late Majesty said on her visit to my country, with the benefit of historical hindsight, one could wish that many things had been done differently or not at all. I think her wise remarks in Dublin could be said quite accurately in many other countries. The United Kingdom is a member of the Commonwealth and has been allowed to be a member of the Commonwealth because it has repudiated the negative aspects of colonialism and imperialism. Mm. The Commonwealth will not have a future unless that is truly known. Can young people help there? We definitely can. And I think that's one of the spaces that we have been falling short. 
partially because we, in, as young people in the youth networks and in other Commonwealth spaces doing our work, sometimes we tend to concentrate on our specific areas, so human rights, democracy, or sports, but we don't think about the legacy. So one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last two weeks since we lost Dr. Charles, and one of the things I've been talking about with some friends, is how do we look for those people who started the legacy whether they're still with us or not how do we pinpoint them and spotlight them and what they stood for and bring those as examples to our friends and to our colleagues as profiles so that we can really show what the commonwealth was built on and how we can use that to go forward it's not something we've done very well in the past we've not talked about that legacy a great lot as young people but i think it's definitely something that we need to do and is worth doing well, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, one of the Year of Youth projects that we are we have embarked on in the team, and we have a member of the project management team here for the Year of Youth, Donna, is creating a virtual museum um, where we are taking those stories, your stories, and recording them and archiving them in a way that it is accessible for people everywhere. So it's an ambitious project, but it's a project that can grow with time and. All the stories are the lessons that you have, the memories that you have. We want to capture those stories and have them there for future generations or generations now and to come to be able to reflect on that. Um, you know, we are, we're making great progress with the project, but I, would, I could definitely see a room, a virtual room, filled by members of the Commonwealth Association who have a story to tell about what the Commonwealth should mean or needs to mean going forward into the future. So I want to welcome you to join with us. I mean, Donna is here. You know our contact details. We just need to organize for you to do your video message and you tell your story. And that story is left for anywhere. It's virtual. You can access it anywhere, anytime. It's not bounded in some museum somewhere like this. It's virtual. And it will be for the youth to really benefit using all the available new technology. So I think on the back end of what you said, which I think we welcome so much, there's a space for you to help re-educate or educate the young people, not just now, but for future generations. And I think you are the most excellent group to begin that part, to contribute to that project. So I commend that to you as an, uh, another step from this meeting. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lane. Well, uh, I think um, we need, are in need of refreshment after what has been uh, a, a, a fabulous lecture and a great question and answer session as well. Um, but I'm going to ask Raja Gomez to come forward and say a few words uh, of thanks on our behalf. Uh, Raja was a former director of the Commonwealth Youth Programme, and uh, so he will remember, he doesn't look it, I know, because he's a very <laughs> youthful sort of character, but he will have uh, many memories of those those uh, uh, very early days in the youth program. Thank you, Chairman. That was indeed, as so many people have said, a very passionate presentation that we heard. And one of the, it's, uh, we must be very grateful that you've come to speak about can the Commonwealth be youth to a group of people who have to ask themselves, can the Commonwealth be the aged? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a con it's something that always goes through my mind, but uh, I, was, I was making a few points from what you said. Uh, and you can see that I'm aged because I was making the points not on this, but on this. That's okay. <laughs> uh, the contribution that young people can make. And I think that's one of the areas where a mutual exchange between the experienced and the non-experienced or the youth has a lot of opportunity that we can utilize and which we should exploit in the, in the Commonwealth. Uh, the creation of opportunities and strong mentorship where again, I hope there is something that can be contributed by people in this room mm. to the group that we are trying to set up with CYP. Uh, the necessity for young people to be involved at the highest levels in decision-making 
is something that we have been pushing, but the experience goes up and down, it varies. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was the director of the CYP, we did, we, our highest executive body was the Commonwealth Youth Affairs Council, which was uh, ministers or their highest officials attending. We managed to persuade them to have one young person on the group. And I think that's something that, that worked out well. Uh, there are various other things that we did which I can see have to be met with a different kind of answer. Uh, it's a different kind of challenge from what we were used to. And I'm talking of having left the Commonwealth Youth Program 31 years ago. Uh, it was a different set of challenges and we had different sets of answers. But I can see where the commonalities can lie in both areas and where we should be able to cooperate with CYP in the first instance. And I hope you will be available in this area yourself, Sheris, yes. <laughs> to, to assist where, uh, where it is needed. Thank you very much for what has been a, an excellent evening. And with your permission, Mr. Chairman, can I ask my colleagues and friends here to join with me in thanking our lecturer in the usual manner? Thank you very much. <laughs> A drink awaits.